Um, I've been asked to talk about ribosomal structure and function, and I thought this would be a very easy talk to give because I've been working on this for more than 45 years. But the more I realized, the more I realized the, how much material I could cover. As you're probably all aware, ribosomes are ancient, and they've been around since life began, or you could actually turn that around and say life began when ribosomes uh, appeared. And the purpose of a ribosome is essentially to make protein. And it's to link um, an alpha amino group of one amino acid with the uh, carbonyl carbon of another amino acid. Uh, in this case, they're bound to tRNA, amino acyl tRNA, and peptidyl tRNA. And you form a peptide bond, which is right here. And so that's the reaction we're going to talk about initially, because this is how as Mike Harris will tell us later, uh, life began. So this reaction occurs in the ribosome on the larger subunit, be it 50S or 60S, and um, it occurs in an area which we have called for many years the peptidyl transferase region. The, the amino acid is not alone. Because if it were, it could have a lot of rotation. It would be hard to find the other amino acids. So amino acids are actually attached to tRNA structures tRNAs um, were actually proposed years before they were actually discovered uh, in the laboratory by uh, Francis Crick in 1957. It wasn't uh, eight years later before Robert Holly had actually crystallized the tRNA, which you see here. Now, tRNAs have two really reactive groups. One is the 3 prime in hydroxyl of the CCA, where the amino acid is attached. The other is down at this other end of the molecule down here, where you have in this open loop that Dino talked about, which makes these bases accessible, this is the anti-codon, which will base pair with the codon and the messenger RNA. So this is, um, this is really, this is a molecule that really does the translation when we talk about protein synthesis being translation, because it, it uh, links a um, amino acid sequence with a nucleotide sequence. Reading the genetic code, it makes protein. OK, the other point to understand when we're talking about tRNAs and ribosomes and protein synthesis is that these tRNAs actually span the two subunits. So we have uh, the amino acyl end of the tRNA into the 50S subunit, and we have the decoding with the anticodon on the messenger RNA here on the 30S subunit. Now, when the amino acid comes to the ribosome, it comes attached to a tRNA, but this is a reaction that is occurring at an, an incredibly rapid rate. And since there are 20 different amino acids and the cell doesn't know which amino acid it's supposed to uh, take, it's only supposed to determine that by complementary sequence of the anticodon, there are a lot of tRNAs that will go into the, into the A, A site on the 30S, and um, they're wrong. In fact, uh, 19 out of 20 are wrong, or there are actually about 40 different tRNAs. Um, so it's going on and off and on and off at a terrific rate. But that's the first reaction you want to have happen when the tRNA goes onto the ribosome. You want to determine that it's the correct tRNA, and it base pairs with the, with the codon. You want not to have the amino acid actually go into the P site or the A site uh, on the larger subunit because it's got to be proofed first to make sure it's the right amino acid with the right codon. So uh, the way the cell deals with this is to add a protein factor which you've heard about called EFTU. EFTU binds to the amino acyl part of the tRNA and protects it from actually interacting with the decoding, I mean with the peptidyl transferase region. EFTU also has other functions, of course. It, it facilitates binding the synthetase and putting the amino acid on here. And EFTU also has an affinity for the 50S subunit or the 60S subunit. So it's, it's actually bringing the tRNA to the ribosome, but it's protecting it at the same time, protecting this until you're certain that you have the right tRNA. And then at that point, you can form the peptide bond. So if the, if the Base pairing is correct at the codon anticodon. A signal is sent from the 30S subunit to the 50S subunit saying, we're going to take this tRNA and we're going to add the amino acid at the 3' end 
into the growing peptide. OK, so here's where we have to make this transition, because now we're going to talk about an enormous amount of data that's been collected over the last 45 or so years about the structure and the function of the ribosome. And I'm going to have a transition point at the year 2000, because in the year 2000, we had the appearance of crystal structures of the ribosome. And all of a sudden, we had this enormous amount of information, and now we could fit it in to precise crystal structures. But until 2000, until we really had crystals, we were looking at the ribosome at a distance and from the outside. Here's what the ribosome looked like after the year 2000. And as you can see, it didn't really make things easier because it looks much more complex. And a lot of people like to stay with this structure for a while. Uh, eventually, we got used to dealing with this. This is a messenger RNA. This is the small subunit, the large subunit. Um, you can notice the, uh, the, the amino acids, I mean, the, uh, the proteins are essentially on the periphery of the ribosome. They have globular parts, in most cases, sitting on the outside of the ribosome. And they have arms extending into the ribosome, in, in many cases, into functional regions. Um, these are the three different tRNAs. Messenger RNA is here. I'll show you later how it winds around the head of the smaller subunit. This is an extension called the L7L12, which is actually four proteins of the same. Uh, and they are on the left side. When the factors come in during translation, they seem to facilitate the motion. So a lot of the information, that remarkable amount of information that we had collected, all of a sudden made beautiful sense. And the most incredible thing was as we looked at these data, we realized that um, it all fit. All the genetic, all the biochemical, all the structural and functional data we had collected over 40 years fit into this structure. And it was, I think that was one of the most exciting points that we had. OK. Now, if you ever go to a ribosome meeting, you'll be surprised because there are really two kinds of people in the world who work on ribosomes. Those who work on structure, and then you have another group sitting over here who work on function. Okay. They do talk to each other, but they have a different focus. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the structure folks did initially, and then I'll talk somewhat about function. And then we'll try to put some information from the crystal structure together so you can see how the ribosome is working with crystal structure. Initially, um, the structure folks identified ribosomes by electron microscopy back in the 50s. And they could see these little particles mainly in eukaryotic cells. And they didn't know what they were, but they, they guessed they were involved in protein synthesis because they did bind radioactive amino acids. Um, but as in all science, the progress made in study the, studying the ribosome really depended on the development of new technology. And the ne next technique that came about was the application of ultracentrifuge, which has allowed it, us to isolate the different ribosomes and actually separate the subunits. And once we had them separated by the ultracentrifuge, then we could take them apart and we could look at the protein and the RNA components separately, either using further uses of ultracentrifugation or chromatography. At that point, uh, in the, about 1966, it was discovered that you could actually put RNA onto a gel and separate it. And so we had this nice analytical technique. Chromatography and ultracentrifuge can be both preparative and analytical. But what we could see with electrophoresis was resolution not only of intact RNAs, but we could see changes in the conformation that were reflected in the size of the structure. And so we could see different bands of RNA, which were the same molecule. But we got the hint, the understanding that the, the RNA was really much more complex than we had thought initially. Um, there were some very good chemists who began to work on ribosomes. Uh, one of the early studies was if you have a ribosome and you know that there are this many proteins here, how are they related to each other? So some chemists would take uh, bifunctional reagents, which would have two reactive groups, add it to the ribosome, and then cross-link it to the ribosomal proteins, and then isolate these uh, dimers. 
And then you could chemically separate them just by adding a sulfhydryl compound and identify which proteins are next to each other. So this is one approach that was taken. Uh, synthesis was important early on because they were able to synthesize not only the, the triplets for breaking the code, but synthesizing messenger RNAs. And of course, Fred Sanger, uh, who Jim actually worked with many years ago, uh, who originally developed the technique for sequencing proteins, then developed technique for sequencing RNA, and then developed technique for sequencing DNA. And they only gave him two Nobel Prizes, but he, it was fortunate there was nothing else to sequence. Um, but sequencing became absolutely critical because at the same time that sequencing was developing, computers were beginning to be used. And there were people who were looking at the sequences and looking for uh, repetitions of structure from one ribosomal RNA to another. These are people like Carl Woese, Harry Noller, and Robin Guttel. And they began to see sequences that were repeated in different ribosomal RNAs, and they were almost identical. In fact, they were identical in some regions. And these highly conserved sequences, of course, signified these are probably important sequences as far as function. And you see these in the peptidyl transferase region. You see these in the coding region and so forth. So they made an interesting story out of using computers and finding these uh, sequence conservation. Uh, you could also play certain games and see changes. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But So these are the techniques that were being developed during this time until finally we got to uh, the crystal structures with Adi Onath had worked many years on trying to crystallize. She crystallized but hadn't resolved the structures. Tom Stites came along and did some very nice work at Yale. And Venki Ramakrishnan really deserves credit for working out the, the functional association of what they found in the crystals. And Harry Noller, who did not get the prize like the other three, uh, is really the person who I consider the person who has done the most to contribute to our understanding of the ribosome over the years. OK, you can't give a ribosome lecture without showing this kind of a slide. And this shows you bacterial ribosomes and eukaryotic ribosomes. And the first thing you notice, not that they're all green, but the fact that they actually look fairly much like each other. The 60S is larger than the 50S, uh, but they both have arms like this. And um, the 30 S's look pretty much the same. They both have a head, and they have shoulders. And the messenger RNA, of course, goes around the head. Um, the composition is pretty much the same. You'll say, oh, but there's an extra RNA here in the eukaryotic. Se if you look at the sequence of the 5.8 S RNA, it looks very much like the sequence of the 5 prime end of the 23 S RNA. So what it really is is, is a break in the 23 S creating a new RNA there. So the sequences, uh, there are highly conserved sequences in here, but there are differences uh, as well. And as you can see, the ribosomal RNAs in eukaryotic cells are bigger, but that doesn't mean that they have a much different structure. They have pretty much the same basic structure, the same core structure, except that at the ends of all of these hairpin loops, they have extensions, which are called extension uh, sequences. And that's how they get bigger. They just extend the, the, uh, the stem structures and uh, with, a, with a few new st uh, structures as well. Uh, there are about 54 or 55 proteins here. And there are uh, many more, close to 80 in the eukaryotic ribosome, depending on which one you're looking at. But again, highly conserved sequences are found at important functional sites. Oh, this sort of summarizes what I was talking about, the fact ribosomal proteins are basic. They uh, bind uh, with ionic interactions, generally recognizing the overall structure and less the sequence, although there are a few proteins that recognize particular uh, regions of the ribosomal RNA. Uh, the proteins are usually in a one-to-one -one ratio with the RNA. And there are uh, some, there's L7, L12, which is in four copies. The proteins are added to the RNA in a sequence during assembly, which resembles the addition of proteins in in vitro reconstitution. You can actually take the RNA and the proteins and combine them under correct conditions with heat and reconstitute the ribosome. There's nothing magic 
there are factors which facilitate the assembly, but you can do it with just the ribosome components itself. Uh, ribosomal RNA is acidic, of course, and it is initially made in a much longer uh, sequence and then cut into the pieces, uh, themselves being precursors which are subsequently cleaved down to the correct size. The RNA is modified both on the sugars and modified in the bases at a number of places, as are some proteins modified as well. The RNA secondary and tertiary structures um, are quite, uh, well, they're repetitive from one sequence to another, but they're flexible. So what, I'm, what I think you should remember as I go through all this information is that I'm telling you a lot of information about the structure, but think of the structure as flexible because even though they have highly conserved sequences and they have tertiary structure, the ribosomal RNA is actually, I think, moving. And we're beginning to see more evidence of that sort of thing, uh, especially if you check the structure at different temperatures. And I'll show you some evidence right at the end of that. Okay, so uh, looking at the ribosomal RNA, um, there were a number of techniques that were used. One was to we didn't know anything about the ribosome, so what we wanted to do was to see what parts of this long stretch of the RNA are base paired and what parts are not. Well, you can react the RNA with, with single different, a uh, series of different compounds like Keithoxyl, DMS, CMCT, and uh, some of these will react with single-stranded regions, and uh, then you can identify the sites that were modified because if you're trying to make an extension of uh, a DNA that would, uh, an oligo that would base pair here and extend, it would stop at that modified site. And so that would tell you whether or not that was chemically reactive, meaning whether it was single-stranded or double-stranded. That's one approach. Another approach was to use uh, nucleases that were specific for single-strand or double-strand. And uh, some of the older folks in the audience will remember pan pancreatic RNAs and T1 and cobra venom uh, nuclease which got single and double-stranded regions. Um, and then there was cross-linking that was done to link different regions of, of the RNA. Um, and then there was Carl Woese who put this all together. And he looked at the data and he began to see regions that looked like they were base paired, but his question was, is that GC really a GC when you have these two strands come together or not? And so he looked for other sequences for other RNAs at that particular site. And if he saw that it could be an AU instead of a GC, that was evidence and support that it really did require a base paired stem structure at that point. So uh, in the end, this is the picture we had. OK, this is before crystallography. And we had this evidence accumulated from antibodies binding to um, ribosomal proteins telling us these are the sites where the proteins are. And this is the cross-linking data uh, confirming that what we saw here was also quite valid here. There's got to be some questions. Or have I gone too fast? You're still with me? OK. OK, so this is, this is where we were. Um, and this, this is the, the functional information we had. We knew the process of translation before the crystal structure uh, appeared. What I'm going to do now, after we go through this slide, is to address the crystal structure data and how it relates to these three processes, decoding, peptide bond formation, and translocation. And all of that occurs during elongation. So once you have the message and you have a ribosome and it's moving along, you have the tRNA coming in, uh, you form the peptide bond, and then you have to translate, locate along the message. Those are the three steps we will address in here. I think just to, for the non-ribosome or non-translation folks, let me just give you a quick overview of translation. Uh, this is a process as the ribosomes move along the messenger RNA, but it really starts with the smaller subunit interacting with factors, protein factors, that bring the messenger RNA and the initiator tRNA to the ribosome and form an initiation complex, which then can bring the 50S together to form a 70S, and then you're off and running right here. 
you keep going until you come to one of three stop codons. When you get there, then uh, protein factors come in and they recognize the, the uh, stop codon and they trigger the peptidyl transferase region to open up and allow uh, a water molecule to come in and hydrolyze the peptide attached to the tRNA. And then you initiate the termination process. So these release factors uh, cause that process to occur. Then you have to get rid of the release factors, and then you have to get rid of uh, the factors, get rid of the release factors, and, and so forth. So you have the release factors, and you have RF3, and then you have R RRF. And finally, you dissociate everything back, and you start over again. OK, <clears throat> before I do move on to these three steps, though, let me just tell you a few things about what we, we know about some of these that are quite interesting little take-home lessons. Initiation is not a, a um, looks like this is gone. Initiation is, is not a um, quiet little process without changes. Recently, there was a paper uh, studying the, the effect of IF1 on the uh, 30S subunit, and they noticed that one particular base in the decoding region at 1408 uh, is protected when you add IF3, and then when tRNA comes, and it also uh, blocks the binding of the 50S subunit, wherever the 50S is, right here. Um, and when you do bring in the correct tRNA into the ribosome, then they actually see a change in the reactivity of 1408, such that now the 50S combined and IF3 leaves. So we're beginning to see changes in the structure by this kind of reaction. Uh, FMET tRNA, uh, what do we know about FMET? Well, someone asked me recently, why does FMET tRNA always go to the P site and all the other tRNAs go to the A site? And the answer is, if you look at the structure of FMET tRNA, you'll see in the anticodon stem region, there are actually three GC base pairs. And in the, in the, the arm to the right, right at the attachment to the rest of the tRNA, there is a GU pair at that site that's characteristic of the FMET. Uh, and the other characteristic that's unique for the FMET is at the very top, where you have the five and three prime ends, they're always base paired in other tRNAs. They're not base paired. The structure as a result is really quite different. And as a result, the, this tRNA that's involved in initiation is recognized by initiation factor two, which is the equivalent of TU. And it doesn't recognize, it will not bind with TU in the same way all the other tRNAs won't bind with IF2. So it's specific, and it takes it to the, to the A site. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little about the, pept the historically about the peptidyl transferase region. Um, people in the back will remember if, if you look at the past history of just about everyone who worked on ribosomes, at some time in their career, in a discussion section of one of their papers, they said, we continue to look for the ribosomal protein that carries the peptidyl transferase activity. Even people who are really hardcore ribosomal RNA people now, they all said at one time that they thought uh, the peptidyl transferase, it had to be a protein. Um, and of course, it turned out not to be a protein. And Harry Nala showed uh, a few years ago that you could take the ribosome and you could treat it with protease, and it still had peptide bond formation activity. So the ribosome is a ribozyme, which will, was confirmed by crystal structure data. And you'll see in a minute. Um, but we all went through this stage where uh, we all believe the same thing. OK, hybrid ribosomes, we'll talk about that, the fact that Early on, when, when uh, Watson and Crick uh, focused, well, actually, it was Watson who wrote a really nice review on protein synthesis. And the tRNAs would go into the A site, move to the P site, move to the E site. Well, there was no E site originally, but they just moved like this. And it was later shown that ribosomes come in here, but actually, they go like this as they move from the A site to the P site and so forth. And these are called hybrids. Uh, hybrid also reminds me that we did an experiment a few years ago where we took E. coli ribosomes uh, 
and we took Thermus thermophilus ribosomes, which are a, both bacteria, and, uh, but they evolved, they separated from each other a couple hundred million years ago. And we mixed the 30S from coli with the 50S from thermos and vice versa. And then did an in vitro translation assay to see if they would work with each other, and they did. The only thing that was a little different was where they initiated, or we couldn't tell whether it was initiation or termination. But the reason I'm telling you that is that the, the, the structure, after all of these millions of years going their own separate ways, were still sufficiently intact that they could actually combine and make protein. Um, termination, the other point to make on termination, and I'm telling you all these things because these are all things we wrestled with over the years. Uh, I think the hardest thing for a lot of people, myself included, in understanding termination was that we were so fixed on initiation involving base pairing between RNAs that we thought termination would be the same. And so we were all looking for sequences where RNA would match RNA and cause termination. It turns out termination involves proteins that recognize termination sequences, these release factors that, that are shown down here. Release factors recognizing UGA, UAG, or UAA termination codons. And then finally, the assembly. Uh, some beautiful work on ribosomes was done early on by Masayasu Nomura, who recently uh, passed away. And he was able to reconstitute these ribosomes, uh, taking some of the mystique out of these and allowing us to look at ribosomes as structures that actually we thought we could then understand, because there really wasn't any magic. We could take them apart. We could remove a protein, we could see what the effect on function was, and so forth. OK, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some crystal structure data and just show you where things are relative to one another. So these are crystal structures of the 30S and the 50S. And what I've done is I've taken a ribosome, these are the two subunits, and I've opened them up like that. So you're looking at the interface side. And the interface is where the tRNA fits. The tRNA, remember, is spanning between the two subunits. And here is where the A, P, and the E site tRNAs are on the 30th subunit. And in this, of course, the message would be right behind them. And the anticodon uh, parts of the tRNA would be base pairing to the messenger right here. These two uh, CCA ends of the two tRNAs in the E and P site are not actually touching the 30S subunit, but they're reaching over into the 50S and right into this region right here. So you have to think of these as coming out at you in this structure. OK, here's a picture of the RNA itself, 16S RNA, with uh, in the secondary structure of 16S as we knew it before the crystals. And then you can take this and you can fold it into the shape you have in the ribosome. Now, the, the striking thing is you've got one, two, three, four major domains. And if you look at the way they fold into the ribosome, you see one, two, three, four major domains. And they're separate from each other. They're separate, sufficiently separate that you say, hey, maybe there's some kind of flexibility. And if there's flexibility, where is the site of rotation? And you can see the center for, for these four domains is right in here. And this is a structure called a pseudonaut. And it's, it's a loop, and the top of the loop actually base pairs with another stem, creating a structure that uh, crystallographically looks like a knot. It's not really a knot. But here is the pseudonaut, and this is sort of the center of these four. And you can see the structures here. They're all identified with the head and the beak and the, and the shoulder, or the platform, and so forth. OK, but now if you look at the 23S, it's actually quite different. OK, there are six domains, this one being the domain where peptidyl transferase occurs. And the beauty of this is once you look at this, you say, how did they ever put that together? Look at how interwoven the RNAs are from each of these different domains. It's almost like it, it turns into a blue-gray color because you've mixed all of these together. It's totally different than what you saw on the 16S. And if you see the separation here, and then you, you see the way this is fixed, 
this makes sense with the understanding that there's probably a lot more movement in the 30S, which is may, maybe more involved in moving the message in the tRNA through the ribosome than you see with the 50S. Once again, this is where the peptidyl transferase region is. <coughs> Any questions on this? OK, and then this is just showing you, again, the structure of the two sub subunits separated. And you see the tRNAs uh, right here is the peptidyl transferase region. And these, these two have come together. And here they are separated. Uh, they're decoding over here. Um, this is L7, L12. This, the, uh, again, you can see somewhat from this picture also that the, the structure of the RNA is highly folded. And the, the proteins are centered more on the outside, but they do have these long uh, strands that will go into the ribosome as well in many cases. OK, so now let's talk about those three functions I wanted to address as far as decoding and um, peptide bond formation and translocation. And the one that takes the most time is decoding. Uh, and we'll spend a few slides on this. Um, you always want to put the right tRNA with the right codon. And that's the right tRNA is called the cognate sequence. So um, if you have U, 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 and you would, oh, somehow these got moved over, uh, A, A, G, that is, that is uh, perfectly acceptable. The, the G, U at the end is a mismatch, but that's a wobble base. And you can have a uh, wobble at the third base, but the A, A, uh, AU, AU here is a correct codon. So that's cognate. Um, the CCA with the UGA would have one mismatch, in this case, in the first base. You could have a mismatch in the second base. Those are called near cognate. Those are not acceptable to the ribosome. The ribosome has a very finely tuned process of separating cognate and near cognate. And certainly the non cognate are not accepted. I mean, Here's where you have mismatches in both the first and the second uh, bases. So the, the ribosome is trying to, to only pick the cognate tRNA. And of course, you know that there are three codons. There are four different bases. Four times four times four is 64 different options. You have three stop codons. So you're left with 61 codons for 20 amino acids. You have about 41 uh, tRNAs in uh, bacteria. And so you do have uh, many cases where you have a wobble base uh, that accounts for the fact you can have all four codons. Uh, you can have up to four or so with uh, each amino acid. There are really only two, base, uh, two amino acids that have a single codon. That's tryptophan and methionine. OK. So, how does the ribosome select the right tRNA? Uh, before we had the crystal structure data really coming out, uh, Jody Puglisi actually synthesized a fragment of the 3' prime end of 16S RNA. And um, looks like this is going. I can come over and show you. This, these two A residues were uh, in this loop right here. And those two A's turned out to be absolutely critical to uh, the identification of the correct tRNA. And once we had the critical crystal structures, this one being uh, uh, Vinky Ramakrishnan's picture of the, uh, of the 30S and the 50S together, he was showing that this is the place of the decoding, and here is the decoding region. And he was showing the, the anticodon stem loop of the tRNA the anticodon here and the messenger RNA here. And he showed what was happening here. But you can see it a little better on this picture up here. This is looking right into the decoding region of the 30S subunit. And these are the key actors of this. Uh, there are two bases on this long helix. Remember the fourth helix, uh, the fourth domain of the, of the 16S RNA uh, contains the decoding region. 1492 and 1493 are bases that are sort of packed into helix 44's minor groove. And they're sitting right here. And when the correct tRNA or any tRNA comes in, they flip out. And so here we have a messenger RNA and an anticodon stem loop. And there's a base pairing 
here between the three bases. And uh, the side that we're looking at right here is the minor groove of the, of the helix formed, the small helix between the mRNA and the anticodon stem loop. And those two bases look in, and it's not a matter of checking to see how long, how strong the base pairing is between the codon and the anticodon. It's a, it's a matter of geometry. And if those two A residues fit, then they will take that tRNA. And if they fit, um, then they will send a signal. As you see, protein S12 is right here. We think part of the signal is they send a signal through S12, which has a contact with the tRNA at another place, which goes and, and sends a signal to TU, which then hydrolyzes the GTP on the TU. And then that changes the structure of TU, and it releases the tRNA from the TU. And then the other end of the tRNA can flip into the 50th subunit. So we'll go over that again, but the point is it's a matter of these two bases. Every time a tRNA comes in, they go in and they check, and if it's not the correct match, they, they come back and the tRNA floats off. If it is correct, then they go with the next steps to incorporate that tRNA into the growing peptide. Okay, there, there's an interesting story here, too, because this minor groove is also a place where an antibiotic can bind very nicely. It's called peromomycin, and you see it right here. And peromomycin tends to go in and just sit there, and when it does, it displaces these two A residues. They come out. So it's like the peromomycin has already initiated the acceptance of a tRNA. So here it's already pushed these two in into this state. That facilitates the acceptance of tRNAs that aren't quite right. So it will accept near-cognate tRNAs uh, in the presence of peromomycin in some cases. Um, and so you look at these two structures with and without peromomycin, and you see that they really look quite the same. So this was a nice demonstration of, of how an antibiotic can affect function, and we can understand it because we can actually see what the structural effect of the antibiotic was here. And this just shows you what you couldn't see on the other uh, figures, but this is looking at the interactions of the, the, first, um, the first base of the uh, messenger RNA interacting with the third base of the tRNA. And this is the 1493A residue that was going into the minor groove, which Nino talked about, the minor groove being on this side, the major groove being on the side that has the bases exposed. And again, for the second position, you can again see uh, 1492A coming in and looking at those two. And the interesting thing is there is no 1491 that goes in and checks. That was a G. Uh, at this point, we have other bases like 530. And uh, I can actually go back and show you what. OK, they're right here. So. 530 and 1054 also get into the act as far as interacting with the third base. And 530 goes from the sins to the uh, uh, transform here. And the, the, the 1054, you can see the, the change in the structure going from like that to like this for the 530. And then you see that here. So there's 530 and 1054 would be up here. And then also, they put in an, uh, a, a wobble base with uh, inosine and A. And you can see they look just as good uh, with the wobble base as they do with the regular base, going back and forth. OK, so the decoding process, uh, cognate tRNA or near cognate with permomycin, comes into the A site in the 30th subunit. The ribosome recognizes this, and it recognizes the base pairing geometry in the minor groove. And, uh, and then the head folds on the shoulder in the A site are on the A site tRNA. And there is a transition called the transition from the open to the closed. And fortunately for us, we look somewhat like 30 S subunits. We have a head, we have a shoulder. And if you imagine the messenger RNA going around here and the tRNA is coming in, if it's a correct tRNA, your head goes down like that. And that's what happens with the tRNA. And that's going from the open to the closed form. And a protein, an S S12 protein right here, actually makes an interaction with the 16 sRNA, pulling it into that straight. 
Of course, if your head's going like this, you have to have some flexibility in your back. And in the back, there are two proteins called S4 and S5, which are held together by ionic bonds. And at, at the point where your head's going like this, those bonds have to break. So S4 and S5 in your back will open up when S12 binds with 16S. It's great to give an anthropomorphic explanation for these things. You carry it with you forever, right? So um, we'll talk a little about open to close in just a second. I mentioned that once this happens, a signal is sent to TU to, hydro to hydrolyze GTP, and that changes its structure. And once that happens, it doesn't hold on to the tRNA anymore. And the tRNA uh, now goes into the 50S subunit. I hope you're beginning to appreciate how much information there is to tell you. All right. OK, so <clears throat> once again, the open-closed transition involves breaking the S4, S5 polar interactions in the back. And you can imagine if you make mutations in those residues that confer this ionic interaction between these two proteins, then the ribosome will tend to break more often, and it will be accepting tRNAs more often that are near cognate. So that's why we've known for years that, in fact, this was Luigi Guarini's work where he had ribosome, ribosome ambiguity mutations, which are mutations primarily in S4 and S5. And now we know why those gave errors, because they tended to put the ribosome into this. Don't, let me just correct that. They didn't tend to put it into those states. Everything is in flux in the ribosome. It increased the possibility that in the equilibrium, they were more often moving in that direction. And they could be captured by near cognate tRNAs. So with these mutations, the ribosome is more error prone. I told you S12 interacts with the 16 sRNA. If you have mutations in S12, you can actually, because uh, S12 does interact with helix 44 and helix 27, if you have mutations in S12, they destabilize that interaction. So it's much harder for the ribosome to close and accept any tRNA, even the right one. And so you have less acceptance, and you have more accurate, in fact, hyperaccurate. In fact, you can have mutations that are so hyperaccurate that they actually require streptomycin or another drug to kind of put them into that state for the cells to even survive. And this explains how S4, 5, and 12 can uh, compensate for each other. OK, here is, uh, this is also reminding me, this whole movement of the head, we call this motion, an indu excuse me, an induced fit motion where everything is, is, is checking the, <coughs> the, the geometry, and then there are all kinds of changes. And I'm going to show you what these changes look like. So here it goes back and forth. And you can see the motion that is happening. Uh, on the back here is S4 and S5, and you'll see how those uh, open up. Oh. See there? And then down here is where S12 is interacting with, with the uh, helix 44. OK. So this also gives you just a still picture of uh, the backside with S4 and 5. That has to open up. And here's S12 interacting with helix 44. So these come together on the right, and they come apart on the left. This now is talking a little bit, bit more about what I just described. It's called the initial selection. Because it turns out that what I just described was the initial selection of the tRNA. You want to cognate, you don't want to near cognate. And so this initial selection occurs uh, as fixing this in and then releasing the TU. After the TU comes off, the tRNA is sort of holding on for dear life with the codon anticodon. That's really what's holding it on. And so at that point, and it, as you remember here, it was, it, was, uh, it was like, well, there we go. It was, it was actually bent away from this tRNA. And then all of a sudden, it comes in like that. OK? Well, you can look at it from the other side, looking from the far side of the slide now. You can see that when the tRNA, and this is where the amino acid is, was attached to TU, it had this twist. And there's some, some tension here. When that TU is released, now it's going to flip in like that, and it's going to flip this 
over to here, and that's going to go into the A site of the 50S subunit. And that is called uh, the accommodation. And when that happens, then um, in the process, as it's flipping in, if it's not very strong, it can come off. Because nothing's holding on except the codon anticodon interaction. So that's called the proofreading step. So there's the initial selection, which I just spent a lot of time on. And then as the TU comes off, now you have proofreading because now the tRNA is on its own. And if it's really a near cognate, it can come off and be rejected. Or it can be accepted into the P site, into the A site of the 50S. So the fact that you have initial selection and proofreading enhances the fidelity of translation enormously because these are products of, of the two of them as far as the efficiency of, or the accuracy. Okay, so I won't repeat this. This is just what we talked about. What I want to do now is to talk about what's happening in the, in the 50S subunit when the amino acid now goes into the A site. And it's really, there was a lot of discussion once the crystal structure was discovered and a lot of proposals, but the bottom line is there are highly conserved nucleotides in the 50S subunit which um, hold the reactive groups of the two tRNAs together. And they hold them together in such a way that the alpha amino and the carbonyl carbon are so close to each other that they react without any other, anything else needed. It's not an acid-base reaction. It's a reaction caused by bringing them together in proximity. And remember, the amino acid was attached to the tRNA using ATP. So it's, it's not just a uh, nice, quiet, covalent bond, but actually it's reactive. And so the ribosome is reducing the entropy of the reaction and increasing the reaction rate simply by bringing them in together. And maybe some other people in the, in the back row will ex, uh, expand on that a little more, but the point that I want you to take home is that uh, the ribosome doesn't catalyze the reaction by any of our traditional enzymatic reactions, but it's simply entropic, not acid-base. And it, also some ionic bonds do add to stability. Uh, the two prime hydroxyls do. This shows you the picture that they built that model on because um, prior to having the crystal structure, we knew there were two regions in the 23S RNA that were involved in stabilizing one tRNA or the other. When Harry Noller bound tRNAs to the ribosome, uh, in the P site, he saw certain residues protected. When he bound them other, in, other, uh, in the A site, he found other residues protected. And it turns out that these are the residues in the ribosomal RNA that were protected in the A site tRNA and the P site tRNA. And once you looked at the crystal structure, you could see that they actually are forming hydrogen bonds with the CCA end of the tRNAs in the, in the P site or the A site. And this, this is a beautiful confirmation uh, mutations at 2553 and 23S RNA disrupted uh, the tRNA going into the A site, and similarly with 2251 and 2252 uh, disrupting over here. Um, so these highly conserved nucleotides position it just perfectly. And uh, of course, everyone said there's got to be one base that's going to be the, uh, the critical base for the catalysis. And uh, several papers were published saying it was 2451 because if you look at 2451, it's right here. And this is a reactive site. By the way, this is, uh, there was an interesting structure that Mike Yaris made. Uh, it's called TSA here. It's transition state analog. And it was very useful early on because you could just add that and it would go right into the, the uh, peptidyl transferase uh, site on the 50S subunit. And this, again, just shows you 2451 going into this, uh, right, right by this site of the peptide bond. Unfortunately, if you change A2451 to a G, the ribosome will still work. So there's nothing sacred about uh, the A being involved in the catalysis. And of course, everyone said, look, there, there are no ribosomal proteins. This is truly evidence that this is a ribozyme. Um, until you look at the structure and you see that the, the, uh, the two tRNAs and the, where the amino acids are right here are right next to L27. Um, 
And you can cross-link Bob Zimmerman, cross-link L27 to the tRNA here. Uh, however, if you take L27 out of the ribosome, uh, the ribosome will still work. So I guess the bottom line is that they're there facilitating the reaction, as a lot of parts of the molecule are, but uh, they're, not, uh, they're not essential for peptide bond formation. OK, let me just finish by talking a little bit about translocation. Translocation, we got an idea about that from the hybrid studies, uh, Harry Noller and Danish Moazid, um, where they saw the tRNA moving like this through the ribosome. Um, and then more recently, Joachim Frank has done cryo-EM of ribosomes at different stages during translocation and actually seen the movement of the ribosomes relative to each other. So ratcheting movement, movement is what we think is bringing them through. We don't really have good pictures uh, to define translocation yet, but uh, we do know some interesting things about it. Uh, that is a ratcheting movement, but also this, for years the, the, the rule has been that you need to have elongation factor G, which is a translocation factor in GTP, but it turns out uh, a, a Russian scientist, uh, Alexander Spirin, showed you really don't need to have EFG. It goes terribly slow, slowly, but it, but it doesn't require EFG. And then more recently, Rachel's, Rachel Green's group has shown that, um, and Gloria Culver have shown that uh, if you want to control translocation, you really have to have S12 and S13 in the ribosome. Because what they do is they keep the ribosome from just slipping through. I mean, having the message in TRA just slip through. If you take S12 and S13 out of the ribosomes, um, you get translocation just like that. Or if you mutagenize certain residues uh, cysteine residues in S12 and S13, uh, they don't hold the, the uh, mRNA and tRNA in the A site, in the P site. Uh, let's see. This will just show you. Um, this is just showing different states that Harry and, and Danish uh, Nahler and, and Moazid showed where the tRNA comes in. It's the A site and the 30S subunit, and the T site and the 50S subunit. And after it gets uh, decoded, it now moves in. So now you have PP and AA. And as soon as you have that, then you have peptide bond formation, and they switch into a hybrid state. So what they did was really to construct these hybrid states and then modify the ribosomes, and they identified the, the movement through, uh, throughout the ribosome. This just gives you a picture from cryo-EM of translocation. And look at this distance here, this overlap here. Uh, the ribosome is in equilibrium between this state and this state, and it's, it's a ratcheting motion. And what happens is, if you add EFG, it stabilizes it in this form, in this form here. And you see that distance is smaller than it is over here. So it's moved like this, and the EFG catches it. And then um, in the process of catching it, you see that uh, the, the tRNA has gone from the P site over to the E site, and it stays there. And then you hydrolyze GTP. And uh, you then get dissociation of, of, uh, of EFG, and you, you ratchet the bottom part. So first you ratchet over from here to here, stays like that, and now it ratchets back. So the top part is moving to the right. That's what you see over here. And uh, that's as far as we know about translocation right now. Or at least uh, those are the, the best details we have on the structure. OK, I'm going to take, do I have two more minutes? OK. Four. But, four minutes, OK. We'll stand here for two minutes then, OK. Uh, I want to make one last uh, plea not to take all of these data so serious that you think that we know the structure of the ribosome. Because the structure of the ribosome is just what, what you see when you crystallize it. It's down at 4 degrees. It's not, if you're working with a thermophile, it's growing at 70 degrees. That doesn't mean this is a structure. This is the most stable structure we see with a crystal. And we also know that these structures are very flexible. And they're moving, all parts of them are moving all the time. And what I want to show you is some 
data where we've made mutations in the ribosome and selected for resistance to an antibiotic. Now, if you select for resistance to an antibiotic, you're really asking two things. You're asking that the antibiotic doesn't work anymore, but you're also asking that the ribosome still does work. And the only way that can happen is that if the change in the structure sort of weakens the interaction of the antibiotic with the ribosome or some other things that can happen. But at the same time, the new structure is still close enough to the structure that is required for function. And you can do that. This is the beauty of genetics. You don't have to be smart. You just have to know how to select for things. And then the, because these are all random mutations, all you do is you plate out millions of cells and the ones that come up with the presence of streptomycin, here's streptomycin, uh, are the ones that are resistant. And they've also uh, told you these are the ones that grow, obviously. So streptomycin is an antibiotic that's been around for a long time. It was one of the first, if not the first, and still used antibiotic for the treatment of tuberculosis. Unfortunately, there are a lot of antibiotic resistant mutants in TB now. But streptomycin binds right in the heart of the ribosome, of the 30th subunit. It binds in that center place that I told you, I showed you the four domains of 16S. And there was that uh, pseudonaut right in the middle. That's where streptomycin binds. And some of the residues in that pseudonaut are U14. Um, look at where else it binds. It binds right in 1491, right next to the 1492 and 93, which were decoding. It binds to a lysine, which is on S12, which is involved in decoding. It binds to 526 and 527, which are right by the 530, which was involved in decoding. And then these, 14, these three bases are in the pseudonaut. So anytime you get a resistance to streptomycin, it's a, it's a pretty dramatic effect. And we selected for resistance in ribosomal RNA. And we look for mutants that, well, these are the mutants. We got five mutants. And they were all in this pseudonaut region. Um, so this is streptomycin. This is the pseudonaut region right here again, blown up. And you can see where these mutations are. Um, they don't have a great effect on growth rate. They go from 52 to 65 uh, minutes per doubling time. Um, but if you look at the pseudonaut structure, you, it, it's really quite striking because this is the structure of the wild type. And look at, look at this region of pseudonaut. These are base triples. These are not Watson-Crick interactions. This is a U13 uh, with hydrogen bond to U20 with hydrogen bond to A915. This is a, a three-dimensional structure with, with uh, tying everything together in, in a rather complex structure. And what we've done is we've made changes in uh, these different residues. And they have somehow, when we look at the crystal structure of these five mutants, we see that the pseudonaut is still intact, but it's slightly different. And the size of the shape of the head, it's slightly more expanded. And, um, but the ribosomes really grow quite well. And um, what I've done here is to take one of the uh, traditional mutants in protein S12, and it grows really fine in the presence of streptomycin at 72. And one of these mutants that I just showed you at 912 also grows very nicely at 72 degrees. Uh, but if you drop the temperature of this RNA mutant in, in the, the pseudonaut down to 60, it doesn't do so well. It's not so resistant anymore to streptomycin. OK, that's interesting because that tells you that temperature has an effect probably on the structure. And if it has an effect on the structure, it probably affects the binding of the antibiotic to the ribosome. So the four pseudonaut base substitutions confer strong strep resistance at 72, but it's weak at 60 degrees. I just showed you one of the four. This suggests that the mutations reduce strep binding by destabilizing the pseudonaut conformation at higher temperatures, allowing streptomycin not to interfere with translation. But the effect is less pronounced at lower temperature. Now, this is not just a single example. We see this all the time with mutations. You can select for temperature-sensitive mutants. In fact, uh, as I told you early on, ribosomal RNA is modified by methylation, one at, at G527, 
on a G7 modification. And if we knock out that modifying enzyme, these ribosomes also are temperature sensitive. So, uh, this, and that's for another pseudonaut. That's over in, in helix uh, 18. Um, helix 18 is this one over here, and that's a pseudonaut there. So these pseudonauts uh, have a lot of flexibility. And so what I wanted to leave you with was to not be thinking of traditional base pairs in RNA, which is the beauty of, of the ribosome in all RNAs, is that they can form all kinds of base pairs and just let you see this. These are all hydrogen bonding reactions between very traditional A's, C's, G's, and T's, okay? And um, Dino mentioned Hookstein pairs and then reverse Hookstein, wobble, reverse wobble, and, and on it goes. So all of these, if they can retain the function, um, maybe the streptomycin won't bind anymore, but it can come in and, and base pair in a different way. That's the beauty of, of uh, working with RNA, is you have such a diversity of structure, and it, if you select right, you can get a diversity of, you can retain the function. And uh, I will leave the evolutionary implications of this up to Mike Yaris, who we'll talk later today. Thank you. Okay.